or drank at all, but tossed his meat to the dog when he thought my eyes were turned away. There was a look in his eyes that I had never yet seen, and the thought flashed across my mind that it was a look that was scarcely human. I was firmly convinced that, that awful and incredible as was the thing I had seen the night before, yet it was no illusion, no glamour of bewildered sense. In the course of the evening I went again to the doctor's house. He shook his head with an air puzzled and incredulous, and seemed to reflect for a few minutes. You say he still keeps up the medicine, but why? As I understand, all the symptoms he complained of have disappeared long ago. Why should he go on taking this stuff when he is quite well? And by and by, where did he get it made up? At Sace's? I never sent anyone there. The old man is getting careless. Suppose you come with me to the chemist. I should like to have a talk with him. We walked together to the shop. Old Sace knew Dr. Habarden, and was quite ready to give any information. You have been sending that in to Mr. Lester for some weeks, I think, on my prescription, said the doctor, giving the old man a pencil scrap of paper. The chemist put on his great spectacles with trembling uncertainty, and held up the paper with a shaking hand. Oh, yes, he said. I have very little of it left. It is rather an uncommon drug, and I have had it in stock for some time. I must get in some more, if Mr. Lester goes on with it. Kindly let me have a look at the stuff, said Abarden, and the chemist gave him a glass bottle. He took out the stopper and smelt the contents, looked strangely at the old man. Where did you get this, he said. What is it? For one thing, Mr. Sace, it is not what I prescribed. Yes, yes, I see the label is right enough, but I tell you, this is not the drug. I have had it a long time, said the old man in feeble terror. I got it from Burbage's in the usual way. It is not prescribed often. I have had it on my shelf for some years. You see, there is very little left. You had better give it to me, said a pardon. I'm afraid something wrong has happened. We went out of the shop in silence, the doctor carrying the bottle neatly wrapped up in paper under his arm. Dr. Barden, I said, when we had walked a little away. Dr. Barden? Yes, he said, looking at me gloomily enough. I should like you to tell me what my brother has been taking twice a day for the last month or so. Frankly, Mr. Lester, I don't know. We'll speak of this when we get to my house. We walked on quickly, without another word, till we reached Dr. Barden's. He asked me to sit down, and began pacing up and down the room. His face clouded over, as I could see, with no common fears. Well, he said at length, this is all very strange. It is only natural that you should feel alarmed, but I must confess that my mind is far from easy. We will put aside, if you please, what you told me last night and this morning, but the fact remains that for the last few weeks Mr. Lester has been impregnating his system with a drug which is completely unknown to me. I tell you, it is not what I ordered, and what the stuff the bottle in the bottle really is remains to be seen. He undid the wrapper and cautiously tilted a few grains of the white powder onto a piece of paper, and peered curiously at it. Yes, he said, it is like the sulphate of quinine, as you say, but it is flaky, but smell it. He held the bottle over me, I bent over it. It was a strange, sickly smell, vaporous and overpowering, like some strong anaesthetic. I shall have it analysed, said Dr. Barden. I have a friend who has devoted his whole life to chemistry as a science. Then we shall have something to go on. No, no, say no more about that other matter. I cannot listen to that, and take my advice and think no more about it yourself. That evening my brother did not go out as usual after dinner. I have had my fling, he said with a queer laugh. I must go back to my old ways. A little law will be quite a relaxation after show so sharp a dose of pleasure. He grinned to himself. Soon after, went up to his room. His hand was still bandaged. Dr. Herbarden called a few days later. I have no special news to give you, he said. Chambers is out of town, so I know no more about that stuff than you do. But I should like to see Mr. Lester, if he is in. He's in his room, I said. I will tell him you are here. No, no, I will go up to him. We will have a little quiet talk together. I dare say that we have made a good deal of fuss about very little. For after all, whatever powder it may be, it seems to have done him good. The doctor went upstairs, and standing in the hall I heard his knock, and the opening and shutting of the door. Then I waited in the silent house for an hour, 
and the stillness grew more and more intense as the hands of the clock crept round. Then there sounded from above the noise of, the, of a door shut sharply, and the doctor coming down the stairs. His footsteps crossed the hall. There was a pause at the door. I drew a long, sick breath with difficulty, and saw my face white in a little mirror, and he came in and stood at the door. There was an unutterable horror shining in his eyes. He steadied himself by holding the back of a chair with one hand. His lower lip trembled like a horse's, and he gulped and stammered unintelligible sounds before he spoke. "'I have seen that man,' began in a dry whisper. "'I have been sitting in his presence for the last hour, my God, and I am alive and in my senses. I, who have dealt with death all my life, have dabbled with the melting ruins of the earthly tabernacle. But not this. Oh, no, not this!' And he covered his face with his hands, as if to shut out the sight of something before him. "'Do not send for me again, Mr. Lester,' he said with more composure. "'I can do nothing in this house. Good-bye.' As I watched him totter down the steps, and along the pavement toward the house, it seemed to me that he had aged by ten years since this morning. My brother remained in his room. He called out to me in a voice I hardly recognised, and he was very busy. He would like his meals brought to his door and left there, and I gave the order to the servants from that day. It seemed as if the arbitrary conception we call time had been annihilated for me. I had lived in an ever-present sense of horror, going through the routine of the house mechanically, and only speaking a few necessary words to the servants. Now and then I went out and paced the streets for an hour or two, and came home again. But whether I were without or within, my spirit delayed before the closed door of the upper room, and shuddering waited for it to open. I have said that I scarcely reckoned time, but I suppose it must have been a fortnight after Dr. Hobarden's visit that I came home from my stroll a little refreshed and lightened. The air was sweet and pleasant, and the hazy form of green leaves floating cloud-like in the square and the smell of blossoms had charmed my senses, and I felt happier and walked more briskly. As I delayed a moment at the verge of the pavement, waiting for a van to pass, by before crossing over to the house, I happened to look up at the windows, and instantly there was a rush and swirl of deep cold waters in my ears. My heart leapt up and fell down, down as into a deep hollow, and I was amazed with the dread and terror, without form or shape. I stretched out a hand blindly through the folds of thick darkness from the black and shadowy valley, and held myself from falling while the stones beneath my feet rocked and swayed and tilted, and the sense of solid things seems to think away from me. I had glanced up at the window of my brother's study, and at that moment the blind was drawn aside, and something that had life stared out into the world. Nay, I cannot say I saw a face or any human likeness, a living thing. Two eyes of burning flame glared at me, and they were in the midst of something as formless as my fear, the symbol and presence of all evil and all hideous corruption. I stood shuddering and quaking, as with the grip of an ague, sick, and with unspeakable agonies of fear and loathing, and for five minutes I could not summon force or motion to my limbs. When I was within the door, I ran up the stairs to my brother's room and knocked. "'Francis! Francis!' I cried. For heaven's sake, answer me. What is that horrible thing in your room? Cast it out, Francis. Cast it out from you. I heard a noise as of feet shuffling slowly and awkwardly, and a choking, gurgling sound, as if someone was struggling to find utterance. And then the noise of a voice, broken and stilted, and words that I could scarcely understand. There is nothing here, the voice said. Pray do not disturb me. I am not well today. I turned away, horrified and yet helpless. I could do nothing. I wondered why Francis had lied to me, for I had seen the appearance beyond the glass too plainly to be deceived. Though, though it was but the sight of a moment, and I sat still, conscious there had been something else, something I had seen in the first flash of terror before those burning eyes had looked at me. Suddenly I remembered 
As it lifted my face, the blind was being drawn back, and I had an instant's glance of the thing that was moving it. And in my recollection, I knew that the hideous image was engraved forever on my brain. It was not a hand. There were no fingers that held the blind, but a black stump pushed it aside. The mouldering outline of the clumsy movement as of a beast's paw had glowed into my senses before the darkling waves of terror had overwhelmed me as I went down quickly into the pit. My mind was aghast at the thought of this, and of the thaw awful presence that dwelled my brother in the room. I went to his door and cried to him again, but no answer came. That night one of the servants came up to me and told me in a whisper that for three days food had been regularly placed at the door and left untouched. The maid had knocked, but had received no answer. She had heard the noise of shuffling feet that I had noticed. Day after day went by. Still my brother's meals were brought to his room and left untouched, and though I knocked and called again and again, I could get no answer. The servants began to talk to me. It appeared that they were as alarmed as I. The cook said that when my brother first shut himself up in his room, she used to hear him come out at night and go about the house, and once, she said, the hall door had opened and closed again, but several nights she had heard no sound. The climax came at last. It was in the dusk of the evening. I was sitting in the darkening, dreary room, when a terrible shriek jarred and rang harshly out of the silence. I heard a frightened scurry of feet dashing down the stairs. I waited. The maid servant staggered into the room and faced me, white and trembling. "'Oh, Mr. Lester,' she whispered, "'look, for Lord's sake, look what's, what's happened. "'Look at my hand, look at my hand!' I drew her to the window. I saw there was a black wet stain on her hand. I, I do not understand you, I said. Will you explain to me? I was doing your room just now, she began. I was turning down the bedclothes, and all of a sudden there was something fell upon my hand wet. I looked up. The ceiling was black and dripping on me. I looked at her and bit my lip. Come with me, I said. Bring your candle with you. The room I slept in was beneath my brother's. And as I went in, I felt I was trembling. I looked up at the ceiling, and saw a patch, all black and wet, and a dew of black drops upon it, and a pool of horrible liquor soaking into the white bedclothes. I ran upstairs, knocked loudly. Oh, Francis, Francis, dear brother, what has happened to you? I listened. There was a sound of choking, and noise like water bubbling and regurgitating, but nothing else. I called louder, but no answer came. In spite of what Dr. Hubbard had said, I went 